I'm honored to have been asked to give an introduction to Gordon Baines, BYU's University Archivist and Assistant Department Chair for Manuscripts uh, in the Old Town Perry Special Collections. I know Gordon as a talented associate and friend who has made an indelible mark on every aspect of Special Collections. As many of you know, yesterday Gordon received the Library's Professionalism Award. But his influence is felt far beyond the walls of the Harold Beauty Library. Last year, a panel of his professional colleagues named him <clears throat> as one of the movers and shakers in the archives profession. The nomination for this honor lists many of Gordon's accomplishments. It was noted that he has found varied and innovative ways to bring educational opportunities to archivists through his efforts to bring together regional archivist groups uh, in joint meetings called Western Roundups, which have been held in Las Vegas and Seattle during the past six years. Um, also through the Society of the American Archivist articles authored by himself and uh, his colleague Corey Neimer, uh, Gordon has made an impact on training in the archival profession. And through the creation, again with Corey, of the online journal online publication, the Journal of Western Archives, uh, Gordon has made another mark in the profession. Uh, Gordon has been an energetic advocate of a series of SAA workshops that have brought top-notch training on many aspects of archival work right here to our doorstep at BYU. Gordon didn't start out to be an archivist, however. Coming from a family of physicians, his professional path seemed to be aimed at a medical career. As a BYU undergraduate, he realized that he was more interested in the history of medicine than the practice of medicine. So he bucked family tradition and changed his major from pre-med to history. And as they say, the rest is history. He went on to the University of Chicago, where he received an MA in American history. And happily, one of his professors pointed out that he had a unique talent in working with primary sources and suggested that he consider archives as a career. Gordon changed his plans to get a PhD in history and went to Western Washington University where he received a certificate in archives and records management. His career has taken him to the Oregon Historical Society, the Utah State Archives, and uh, 10 years ago brought him to BYU where he has served as the university archivist. Gordon has been published widely in professional and scholarly journals, is a frequent presenter at our archivist conferences, and has presented, represented the Lee Library in such groups as the Conference of Intermountain Archivists and the Utah Library Association. Continuing his passion for enlightening and educating, Gordon has entitled his presentation today, Illuminating BYU, Uncovering the Treasures of the University Archives. A clever allusion to lighting the why. I'm pleased to present to you my friend and colleague, Gordon Bates. Thank you for that very generous introduction. I hope that you find this talk enlightening. Uh, one of my goals is to talk to you about how you can discover materials in the University Archives and how you can utilize them in your own research. And then to share with you some of the products that have come out of the University Archives, uh, particularly some audiovisual audio products that were created uh, by KBYU and then by the University Communications. So I'm going to talk briefly about the history of the Brigham Young University Archives, give you a little background about the institution in which I work and the role that the University Archives plays in preserving the source material for the study of the history of our great university. I'm going to then highlight the many tools that have been made available to you for discovering material about Brigham Young University. And then I'll talk a little bit about the different ways that you can use those materials to do your own research and your own scholarship, uh, creative and fun ways as well as traditional scholarly ways. This is Brigham Young Academy. Uh, the first institutional record was created in 1875 and established the Academy. Uh, for the next approximately 80 years, not a whole lot was done to preserve the records of the university. Uh, it was sort of, let, well, they got stuck in a closet here or there, somebody thought they were important, they were held on to. In 1956, Ralph Hansen was appointed as the university archi archivist, and the university archives was formally established. 
Um, Hansen's job was to try and salvage what remained of the 80 previous years' historical documents, as well as to put into place a, a program to document the history of the university for the next while, the next 100 years or so. Uh, Hansen did a, a very good job in establishing the archivist. We owe him a great, the archivist, and we owe him a great debt. It's interesting to think about the fact that in 1875, one document established Brigham Young University. As the university has grown from an institution that had one home to an institution that has over 300 buildings on our campus, the number of records uh, produced by the university has also grown exponentially. Uh, we hold in the university archives over 10,000 linear feet of records, and that's just a small fraction of the number of records that the university creates each year. The university archives has had a number of different homes. Uh, it's been housed in the basement of the Mason Memorial Building. It got elevated, literally, into a corner of the, what is now the Jane Corey Lecture Hall in the Mazer Building. Uh, it was then kicked out of the Mazer Building and moved to the ZCMI Warehouse. Uh, they liked that. Uh, it was a little more spacious. Then they moved to the Utah Wholesale Grocery Warehouse, uh, which is now where Records Management is. They came back onto campus and into the Heber J. Grant Library, where they were kept in the basement of the Heber J. Grant Library. They moved to the J. Reuben Clark Library, where they were on, I think it was the fourth floor. And when the name was changed, they stayed there. I think they bounced around between the fourth and the fifth floor for a while. And now we're back in the basement again. And we're happy to be back in the basement of the new edition of the Harold Bailey Library and the L. Tom Perry Special Collections. Moving the University Archives into Special Collections has been a very good fit. And it's allowed us to better serve our patrons, and it's allowed us to interact with our colleagues in ways that we hadn't had the opportunity to do before. As I mentioned, since its founding in 1956, the University Archives has grown from a few bundles of what were mainly presidential records stored in the dusty basement of the Mazer Building to over 10,000 linear feet of permanent records that document the University's various activities uh, that are now stored in a state of an art facility just back behind the walls that way. These materials have been accumulated for two purposes. Uh, the first purpose is they've been accumulated for administrative needs so that the University can carry on its business. But they've also been accumulated to document the history of the university so that people can understand the fact that this is the Lord's University. They can see his hand as they watch and study and learn through the study of the University of Brigham Young University. We house several different categories of records. Um, the first category of records is the organization. That's the reading room where we currently are housed. Uh, the first category of records is organizational records of the university. These are the presidential records, the vice presidential records, administrative records. They include meeting minutes, annual reports, financial records, university publications, including all of the theses and dissertations produced on campus, as well as legal documents. These materials document the administrative function of the history and how it accomplishes its mission to educate students for eternity. The second category of records that we collect is faculty, staff, and administrative papers. These include course notes, syllabi, research files, and personal records, including correspondence, diaries, photographs, and the like, uh, created by faculty and other uh, campus employees. These materials document the intellectual and emotional life of the university. Uh, in many ways, this is one of the harder areas to grapple with, but it's also one of the most important, uh, because the intellectual life is the reason why Brigham University exists. The final category of record that we collect is those of that document student life. Uh, these include the minutes of student clubs, student government records, yearbooks, and student newspapers. And every once in a while, we get lucky and a student donates portions of their diaries that document their personal experiences at the university. Uh, we're looking at ways to try and grab some of that information as it now becomes available on the web, as many students keep blogs and they blog about their experiences. The materials held in the University Archives document every era of Brigham Young University's history from its founding in 1875 as Brigham Young Academy to the university's emergence in the early 21st century as one of the nation's top undergraduate teaching institutions. So that's a little bit about the University Archives. Now I want to talk a little bit about how you go about using the University Archives. The library and the University Archives have made available a large number of tools uh, to help students and faculty researchers and interested parties find materials in the University Archives that will illuminate their interest in the University's history. These tools include Scholar Search, the Library Catalog, the Special Collections Finding Aids website, 
the BYU History blog, and the BYU History Digital Collections website. And I'll talk briefly about each of these. In order to help researchers locate the materials that will be the most useful to them, employees in the archives create catalog records which are searchable through the library's tool, discovery tools. And as I mentioned, these discovery tools include Scholar Search and the library catalog. Scholar Search searches across the library catalog and the library's digital collections, as well as several other databases. Executing a search in Scholar Search for Brigham Young, Inter Brigham Young Academy. returns the following hits result. As you can see, it pulls back a, a lot of different types of materials. There's some images here in the first three hits. It pulls back a journal, um, which is a circular, which was uh, a document sent out to let people know what Brigham Young Academy was teaching, faculty minutes from the academy, a course catalog, the norm, which was an early student publication, as well as uh, more recent records from the Brigham Young Academy Foundation that was interested in trying to save uh, the academy building from being torn down. Uh, Scholar Search is a good place if you don't know the specific topic that you're interested in uh, for the university's history. This will give you a broad smattering of materials. If you do have a more particular topic, uh, I recommend that you go into the library's catalog. And there's two ways to get to the library's catalog. Uh, you can either type in catalog.lib.byu.edu, or you can come to the library's homepage and click into the library catalog. Let's try an alphabetic search for the Brigham Young Academy South American Expedition. Hit return, and you'll, one thing you'll notice uh, with the results is there is a number of results that pull back under the Brigham Young Academy South American Expedition, as well as some other breakdown and subject tracings uh, that allow people to kind of either, they can either select the first one if it meets their needs, or you can scroll down and pick another one of these. Uh, let's click the one that has the most records linked to it, and it pulls back both books that talk about the South American Expedition, as well as archival collections that deal with the South American Expedition, uh, including Benjamin Clough's diary. A very interesting aspect of our university's history that uh, not a lot is known about. The other thing you can do in the library catalog um, is you can do an advanced search. So let's go to the advanced search. Let's say that you're interested in photographs of Brigham Young Academy. Uh, we, we can put in as the subject term again Brigham Young Academy. And then down under the genre form, we can put in photographs. Uh, be sure to limit your library to special collections. Uh, you can run the results return. And you will get back, and it looks like, 32 different collections in the University Archives that have photographs either of the Academy or of what is now the Provo City Library um, in the case of the first couple of hits. Another tool uh, that has been created uh, for helping students and others find materials in both the University Archives and Special Collections is our new Find and Needs database. The Find and Needs database is important because collections in the University Archives vary in size from one folder to over 500 boxes. And researchers generally don't have time to wade through 500 boxes. They need to narrow their search down. And so to help researchers determine what it is they really want to look at, Student employees, and occasionally myself, in the University Archives create what are known as finding aids. And finding aids are guides to our collections. They detail what the series are, they detail sometimes what is in each box, uh, sometimes what's in each folder. The Perry Special Collections recently released a new finding aids website that features several different ways to access information about our manuscript collections. You can do a simple keyword search, and if we do the same search that we've been doing for Brigham Young Academy, It returns a 399 results. Uh, it is important to note that when you are searching through the simple search in our Finding Aids database, not only does it pull back collection level records, if there is a series level record, as it in this case here, it will pull back the series component. Uh, so the 399 doesn't mean that there's 399 collections that have been hit. It means that there are 399 pieces of different Finding Aids 
that have information on Brigham Young Academy. And in this case, in the first hit, it is a photograph of the reunion of the 1881 graduates of the Academy that was taken sometime in the late 1890s. You can also do an advanced keyword search on the New Finding Aids database. Uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about about this advanced keyword search is the number of different options that are available. Uh, if people just want collection level records, they just want to know how many collections there are that deal with Brigham Young Academy, they can click collection level results. If they want to know series as well as sub-series or item level materials that are available, they can search that way. They can also, uh, as we build our digital collections and link those digital materials to the finding aids, be able to search for what's digitized and only the digitized material. Um, we don't have any material right now linked to University Archives finding aids, uh, but I was pleased this afternoon to be stopped in the hall as I was walking over here by someone from the digital lab who let me know that they have recently completed scanning all of UA827, which is our building photographs collection, and are in the process of loading it and combining the metadata with the images so they can load them, and then that will be linked and that finding aid will make its way here into the manuscript collections uh, finding aids database. The other way that people can find materials in the Finding Aids database is through this browse uh, feature. Uh, there are several different ways to browse. Uh, you can browse by the title if you know who you're looking for a particular person. Uh, perhaps we're looking for Benjamin Clough. I'm not sure if there's anything in here from Benjamin. Uh, you can scroll down alphabetically uh, to where Clough would be. And there's the diary of Benjamin Clough as well as a letter. Uh, and they can scroll that way and access those particular materials. Uh, they can access them by subject terms uh, or uh, by collecting area. If you know what you want is in the University Archives, you can come to the collecting area, click on University Archives, and it will pull back an alphabetized list of all of the finding aids in the database that deal with the University Archives. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a few. And we're steadily and constantly adding to that. talk now a little bit about some of the tools that have been made available by the University Archives for getting to know the history of Brigham Young University. Um, about three years ago, uh, Brigham Young the Special Collections moved their website uh, from a static website to a series of interlinking blog instances. We have a main site that people land on for Special Collections, but then there are seven different blog instances that link back to that main site. I was very pleased that one of the blog instances was going to be BYU History. It gives me a chance to blog about the history of the university and to share what I know and to answer questions and then put that information down somewhere where that if I need to answer that question again, I can go back and find it. The BYU History blog can be accessed one of two ways. You can either go to lib.byu.edu slash site slash BYU History or you can go to the Special Collections website which can be reached at sc.lib.byu.edu, and then click over to BYU History. The blog postings that I put up uh, have, are typically in three categories. Uh, the three categories are collection highlights, uh, and one of the things that I've done uh, every year, the Broom Hall Essay Contest honors one of our homecoming founders. Uh, this year it's Garrett Dijon, who is the founding dean of the College of Fine Arts. I have gone through and indicated several collections that relate to Garrett's life. Uh, so people interested in Garrett Dijon who want to get to know him a little better can come listen to an oral history interview done with him. They can take a look at his papers, which include a typewritten report that he gave to Ernest Wilkinson, encouraging more active participation by BYU's musical groups and the dedicatory services of the Mormon Memorial Cemetery, or we can, they can look at a book that talks about him. I also do historical facts. Um, and recently, when uh, BYU announced that they were moving from the Mountain West Conference to the West Coast Conference, uh, I went back and did a little research to find out how many different conferences we belonged to, and I created a blog post to document that. The very first conference BYU joined was in 1918, and it was the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference. We then went to the Mountain States Conference in 1938. Uh, we helped form the Western Athletic Conference in 1962. We also helped form the Mountain West Conference in 1999, and then most of the teams uh, have now moved to the West Coast Conference in 2011. The final category uh, of blog posting that I put up on the website are new tools that are available for people to get a better understanding of the history of the university. And this uh, posting from June is a, an ideal example. Uh, in June, 
the Digital Lab finished scanning at my request the Brigham Young University first 100 years four volume centennial set. Uh, that four volume centennial set is now available online. Uh, it, it's full text searchable. It's a very nice resource for students and those trying to get a handle on the university's history. And this particular blog post talks about the three different ways, there may be another one that I didn't think of, that you can get to uh, this new digitized content. Uh, by going through uh, Scholar Search and doing a search on the title of the publication, by going to the BYU Digi History Digital Collections, which we'll do in a minute, and selecting from a drop-down menu the volume of the Brigham University of the first 100 years you're interested in, or by going to the Internet Archives and running a search on the title within the Internet Archives itself. The other thing that's important to note, this is the dynamic portion of the blog that I, I uh, run. I also have a static portion of the blog uh, that gives a brief history of the University Archives, a little information about us, but it also has bibliographies, uh, which include guides to our collections, as well as guides to collections dealing with the history of Brigham Young University that are not held on our campus. Uh, these institutions include the Utah State Historical Society, the LDS Church at Utah State University, as well as the University of Utah, and a secondary bibliography of sources to help people kind of get a background understanding of the university before they dive into the primary sources. Uh, let's run through RefWorks. And maybe it will No, we'll come back to that one. The other thing that's on here is uh, I was fortunate uh, this past winter semester to have a student intern work for me uh, in creating what I call popular search topic pages. These popular search topic pages are divided into history, presidents, faculty, colleges, departments student life and athletics, and they all have a similar format. What they do is they give a brief introduction to the topic, they identify a couple of secondary sources that would be useful for you to understand the, the materials you're going to look at, and then they indicate the, the primary source materials that we hold in the university archives. They're a great place for students to launch into research about a topic that they're interested in. Uh, my student went above and beyond what I expected. Uh, I expected to get maybe 20 popular search topics out of her over the course of the semester. I think she did 50-something. And so there are quite a few of these that are now available. And they're very useful and fun to take a look at. I encourage you to take a look at them if you get the chance. In 2006, uh, the University Archives began digitizing materials in our holdings in order to make them more widely accessible to our patrons. The first collection digitized was a collection of photographs documenting the University Centennial in 1975. It's actually the photographs that were used to make the book A Thousand Views of a Hundred Years, if you're familiar with that publication. Those images have been digitized and made available online. Oops. And I'm supposed to be one of the technology wizards in the department. Uh, this is a fun site. Uh, it's been a fun site for me because it's um, actually reduced some of the questions that I get because people can go and they can help themselves. Uh, one of the questions that I frequently get in the University of Archives is, I was a student here in 1991, I took this course, I'm trying to go back to school, I need to know what the course description was uh, so that I can get credit for this class. Well now I can point people to the BYU History Digital Collections site because we have all of the course catalogs from 1901 to 2007 here. They've been scanned into the Internet Archive. Uh, the person can come and select the year that they're interested in. So if they're interested in 1961, they can come and click on 1961. It will throw them over into the Internet Archive where they can then either search for the course they're looking for or if they want to page through the course catalog and look for the information that they need. We've done a similar thing with the school yearbooks, the Banyans. Uh, the Banyans were published from 1912 to 1985. And if you were a student here in those years, or if you had a parent that was a student here in those years, you can actually come and take a look at the Banyan and open up the Banyan. And very similarly, you can either search the full text of the Banyan, or you can scroll through and take a look at what student life was like in that particular time frame. We also have a number of early student newspapers that are available through this site, through Content DM, including the Academic Review, the Business Journal, the BYA Student, the Journal of Pedagogy and the Normal, as well as the White and Blue. Uh, these provide a fascinating look into student life on campus. I've run a search for the name Harris, uh, and it pulled back, I think this is the BYA Student, 
And it's interesting, one of the things I like doing about looking at the old periodicals is I love going into the advertisements and see what people are trying to sell to students. And frankly, it doesn't change very much. Uh, the similar types of advertisements show up in the Daily Universe today that show up, were showing up in the Brigham Young Academy student in the 1890s. We've got a clearance sale at the Provo East Co-op. Uh, special attention being called to their endless variety of ladies' kid gloves. There's also an advertisement for the West End store uh, where Joseph Harris uh, carries a full line of dry goods, as well as the Provo West Co-op, which furnishes has furnishing goods for both ladies and gents, including shoes, slippers, and groceries. Three things that you think of together all the time. <laughs> the other thing you can do when you are on the BYU History Digital Collections site, let's see if I can get back to it, is you can search the photograph collections. Uh, right now we have the Thousand Views collection up there. The Building Photographs collection will be added soon. Uh, let's do a search for Alpine, which is uh, my shorthand for the Alpine Summer School. It pulls back a number of images related to the Alpine Summer School. This is uh, a summer school that was held up at Aspen Grove uh, during the summer months, in the particularly in the 1920s. But don't these students look like they're having a good time getting to stay up in the mountains in cabins? Uh, there's a great picture in here of students actually having music lessons in the open air, uh, playing the violin, and I think it's a clarinet or an oboe, I'm not 100% sure. But it's a wonderful site. This is another way we're reaching out to people to give them access to some of the materials that we have in the University Archives that document our extraordinary history. All right, enough about tools. Let's talk a little bit about the ways that the materials in the University Archives can be used. Uh, historically, materials have been used in a variety of ways. Uh, they've been used to create books, articles, student research papers, uh, create courses, as well as class lectures, uh, exhibits, um, like the exhibit that's currently up on the third floor. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, I'd encourage you to go up. It's called Discovering BYU, and it does deal with the history of the university. Uh, my favorite portion of this particular exhibit is we've got three pennants. Uh, you don't see pennants anymore uh, on campuses, but they're wonderful county pennants that students had and used to demonstrate their school spirit. I'd encourage you to go up and take a look at those. Uh, the materials in the University Archives are also used for audio uh, productions as well as visual uh, productions of videos, things like that, that examine the history of the university. The most common use of the materials in the University Archives is the creation of books and articles, as well as student research papers. Uh, one of the most known, well-known books on campus is Educating Zion, uh, and it's a publication that uses speeches given about Brigham Young University and the purposes of Brigham Young University to underscore the importance of education uh, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the particularly unique and important role that Brigham Young University plays in the Church's educational system. Uh, a little known fact is that the text for most of these talks comes from materials held in the University Archives. Another uh, important publication, if uh, somewhat difficult to slog through, mainly because of its size, is Brigham Young University the First 100 Years, the Centennial History, uh, edited by Ernest Wilkinson. It celebrates the first 100 years of the university's existence, and it draws heavily on article resources. In fact, it resulted in a collection, UA 566, that is article materials that were gathered by Wilkinson in the course of creating uh, this Centennial History and were donated to the archives. A more recent publication is From the Muddy River to the Ivory Tower, The Journey of George H. Brimhall by Mary Jane Witcher and Joseph H. Grover. This wonderful biography tells the story of George Brimhall, uh, one of the university's early presidents, and how uh, he became the man that he became. And it draws heavily on the presidential records as well as some of the other records that we have in the university archives that, that are either by contemporaries of Brimhall or uh, created by Brimhall himself. BYU Studies has published a number of articles related to the history of the university, as has the Journal of Mormon History and uh, Dialogue and a couple of other scholarly periodicals. Uh, the article uh, shown here is uh, by LeGrand Richards. Um, most of you, if you know LeGrand, know he goes by Buddy. And it is a wonderful tale of the conversion of Carl G. Mazur and how Carl G. Mazur joins the church basically because of an anti-Mormon book uh, that he got a hold of. And he read the book, and essentially, when he read it, he thought, nobody can be this bad. I need to find out some more about these people. Uh, 
Uh, and he investigated the church, and then as you know, he comes and becomes the second principal of the academy and is our spiritual architect. Students have also written research papers uh, on the role of sports at BYU, the President's Home, the Botany Pond, and the teaching of evolution. They've used the materials in the archives to write essays in honor of the university's founders. As I mentioned, each year the archives partners with the Student Alumni Association to uh, run the Brim Hall Essay Contest. And materials from the archives are utilized in the essays that the students write. Um, every year I put together a list and give it to Russ's rest of students that are referenced as so that they can pre-poll the material because a number of, uh, typically between 50 and 100 students come down to take a look at those materials so they can participate in the essay contest. Uh, it's a fabulous opportunity for students to be introduced to the archives. Many times they've never been into special collections before, uh, but they want to participate in the, art, in the essay contest, and we tell them uh, the simple fact in the, the trainings run by the Alumni Association that so far, not a single winner of the contest has not used materials from the archives in their essays. This year's honoree is Derek DeJong, and students have already come down and begun to mine the materials about Dr. Jong, DeJong that are held by the University Archives. We also do class lectures. I've had the opportunity to speak to English classes, political science classes, and history classes on topics as varied as 1950s politics to sports and literature at BYU. Uh, they're fun lectures to do, and they're fun to introduce students to uh, what we do at the University Archives. I've also had the opportunity to co-teach two courses that are based directly on materials in the University Archives. The first is Honors 100, Discovering BYU, um, a block course that introduces honors students to scholarly research as well as the history of the university. And then I co-taught for a number of years with Brad Westwood, Honors 261, uh, a course called Designing BYU Architecture, Campus Planning, and Landscape Design which introduced students to why our campus is the way it is. Uh, sometimes people say our campus has no character. Uh, it, and that's partly because they don't understand the different architectural styles on campus and why they're where they are. And this course talked about the development of those architectural styles. And there is a theme of non-themeness that runs through our campus, <laughs> if that makes sense. We also do exhibits. Um, as mentioned, the third floor exhibit uh, is on BYU, uh, particularly the aspects of BYU or student life and involvement. Uh, there are materials that help students understand the unique place that they have the opportunity to come to school at. Uh, on Monday, we'll be opening a small case exhibit in the main uh, entrance hallway to special collections called Homecoming at BYU. It is a tradition I hope to start. I did one last year. I hope to do it every year around this time. The documents Homecoming and the things that go on in campus. I was talking with a colleague earlier today about the fact that in 1971 they had a series of themed days uh, for homecoming. They had a Renaissance Day, and a Colonial Day, and a Modern Day, uh, an Alumni Day, and of course they had Game Day. Uh, game Day couldn't be changed to anything else. But for Colonial Day they had a town crier uh, walking around campus announcing different events and different things, uh, which was kind of a fun idea. Uh, things that we don't do anymore. Uh, another thing that they've done at homecoming in years past, which I wouldn't chalk up as a good idea, is they've had tiger wrestling out on the quad. And if you want to see a picture, go to the BYU History Digital Collections, check campus photographs, and search tiger. And you can see the young man wrestling the tiger. And you can decide for yourself whether you think it's a good idea or not. Uh, we also have hosted uh, a large exhibit uh, on, called Designing BYU. Uh, many of you, I think, had the opportunity to come down and take a look at the Designing BYU exhibit that examined many of the themes that we raised in our course. Materials from the University Archives have also served as the basis for a number of audio and visual productions. The KBYU Thinking Aloud program featured an audio broadcast in which I discussed my research on Franklin S. Harris and his impact on the university. And I want to have you take a listen to some of the things I discovered. These are things that I discovered reading the documents in Harris's presidential collections. The following is a production of BYU Broadcasting in cooperation with the Brigham Young University Division of Continuing Education. Hello, I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Thinking Aloud. Our interview program originates from the radio studios of KBYU-FM in Provo, Utah, and these studios are housed in one of the largest buildings on the Brigham Young University campus. It's called the Franklin S. Harris Fine Arts Center. 
As is so often the case with academic buildings and the names they bear, few people know about Franklin S. Harris, who he was, and why his name should figure so prominently, even among people who haven't a clue about him. Today's interview should remedy the situation somewhat. In some ways, were it not for the larger shadow cast by Brigham Young, BYU might well owe its survival during its formative years to Harris. No one has ever thought to rename the institution Franklin S. Harris University. In fact, it may be that no one has even hinted at such a possibility until right now, and even I'm not suggesting it. But hey, credit should be given where credit is due. The story of Franklin S. Harris on today's Thinking Aloud. That probably helped. Uh, I, he also had a plan. He, he puts together uh, in the early 1920s what he calls his program for uh, BYU. And this program outlines where he wants to go. And it explains why he wants to go where he wants to go. And the College of Fine Arts is a very, very important and integral part of where Harris wants to go. Uh, one of the things Harris does when he first gets here is he's, he looks at what BYU is all about. And as the main purpose of the university when Harris arrives is to produce teachers. We're producing teachers that end up teaching in the public school network, teachers that teach in the church school network, teachers that teach in the seminary program, eventually teachers that teach in the institute program. He looks at that and he thinks, BYU's got to have more than producing teachers so as a reason. Scholars and leaders, right? We need scholars and leaders. And Harris's vision of leadership is very expansive. It's not just leadership in agriculture or leadership in the church. It's leaders, leadership in the fine arts, in the sciences, in politics, in uh, world government. Uh, it's leadership in anything you can kind of wrap your hands around. From the time I was a young uh, teenager in the church, uh, the word leadership has been a, a very important catchword. I'm wondering if you have, to, as you've gone through the manuscripts and the documents of way back in the early 20th century, do you have some sense for how that word became a catchword? Was leadership spoken of in such glowing terms in his day, or was he sort of on the vanguard of, of coming up with that philosophy of how societies rally behind individuals? Harris is sort of at the vanguard of that. Uh, the other leader, right, the other person who really kind of preaches leadership and has a very expansive notion of what leadership means is David L. McKay. And Harris's tenure coincides with McKay's tenure as commissioner of education, as a, as a, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And they talk a lot, and they share their views of what it means to be a leader. And I love one of uh, the quotes that uh, President Harris has when he first gets down here. Because for me, it gets at the heart of what BYU is all about. And, and it's something we do now if you change the quote just slightly. And I'm paraphrasing slightly. But in one of his very first addresses on campus to the student body, uh, he tells them, I envision a day uh, when two of a city and two of a county will come to BYU. And they'll become leaders, and they will go back to their city and to their county, and they'll share what they learn. Okay. Recently, University Communications also took a number of materials from the University Archives to create a video that tells the story of White Mountain. Uh, this is a fascinating and interesting excursion into what has become the most prominent symbol of our university. And I'd like to take a look at this. It's about eight minutes long. We're going to watch the whole thing because I think it's well done. And it highlights some of the things that can be done with uh, University Archives materials. And then I'll wrap up. The Y is a beacon on the hill to many people. In an interesting way, it represents home. It identifies us. It tells people that they have arrived to the site of something very unique, very different someplace very special. It's 1906, and Brigham Young University, as a university, is just three years old, an institution still searching for its identity. On a spring day, a conflict between the rival classes of 1906 and 1907 would surprisingly lead to the creation of an enduring symbol of unity and identity. The class of 1907 decides that they want to do something to kind of stake their claim. So they go up and they carve a zero and a seven on the mountain. That made the senior class mad. And so they went up the mountain and took it down and 
they put their own up. So there was a fight uh, between the classes. I believe at one point fisticuffs are actually thrown and it eventually gets broken up and President Brimhall decides something has to be done. We're going to do one symbol, one symbol only, uh, BYU, and this will stand for all of us forever. The original plan was to paint the letters BYU on the mountainside. President Brimhall asks a drafting professor and his students to map out the design. And they went up on the hill with a transient and measured the angle. They tested the angle of the slope, and the way that a block letter was to appear down here in the valley. On an April morning in 1906, students set out to build the first letter. The Y is a monumental 380 feet tall, slightly larger than a football field. They get to work transporting lime and sand up the mountain. So it's 9 o'clock in the morning by the time they get started. They set up a line up the mountain where they're spaced about 8 to 10 feet apart, and they hand bags of a lime-sand mixture from the bottom of the, the hill up to the top, and then they dump it across the Y's surface. It takes a lot longer than anyone thought it was going to take. They'd miss their lunches, and some of the students were fainting. They got tired when they started early in the morning, and they were exhausted lifting these pails back and forth. They thought they'd be through by noon, and they went all the way to 4 o'clock. So they quit and said, whoa, we'll never put the B and the U in there. They became discouraged after making the Y and realized that that was a little bigger project than they could take on. So they left it one-third complete, and Y Mountain was born. In the years that follow, when the original lime and sand mixture begins to wash away, students haul up more lime, rock, and later plaster and whitewash. Whitewashing the Y becomes an annual ritual for the BYU campus. They called it Y Day. They'd go up and paint the Y again, get it clean and white. And so we'd just have a bucket brigade starting at the bottom, and we'd send buckets of whitewash up hand to hand and splash the buckets on the Y and there would be some up there with some brushes who would brush it in and whiten it out. I can remember only once did I have the privilege of being in the Y Brigade, and it was quite a sight. But you could see this long line of students going up there in the buckets being passed from one to the other going up. And it was something that I think everybody looked to all year long, staff, faculty members. As the number of students grows, there's more manpower than needed for the whitewashing effort. Y Day becomes a day of service for all students to work on campus and in the local community. Y Day became a city event where there were too many students to just hand pails up, so they went to city projects. We all went to school in our grubbies. We did the sorts of things like wash walls and really give the place a good clean. It wasn't just on campus. We did things for the elderly or for things that will run down around in the city, in the parks. It really did foster the spirit of we belong to Brigham Young University. Service is what brings people together more than any other thing. In the 1960s, if you didn't participate, they would shave your head or they would toss you in the botany pond. And then they have fun afterwards. They'd have a party with uh, games and refreshments. We had a lot of different contests going on. And actually, one year, I caught the greased pig. And so Y Day was a big, big tradition in those days, and we all looked forward to it. In the late 1970s, the whitewashing tradition comes to an end when the Y is covered with a gunite mixture flown to the site by helicopter. A mix of white cement and white sand keep the symbol vibrant. But Y Days and Lighting the Y continue to be important events for the BYU community. The other tradition that I personally love is the lighting of the Y, uh, because you can see the lit Y from almost anywhere in the valley, and it symbolizes something important that's going on on campus. In the 1940s, the intercollegiate knights were responsible for lighting the Y, using clumps of old mattress stuffing dipped in motor oil. We get the mattress stuffing, make little balls dipped in oil, and then we would take those up to the mountain, we would put a ball about every foot all the way around, and then we would run up and down the Y and light those balls of fire. And from down here, it looked like one solid fire all the way around it. Then they went from that into the torches. I remember that night, 
all of the lights would go out in our home. We would look up on that mountain and we would watch the, the parade of students working their way up with torches on the switchbacks. That was a big thing. In the 70s, we had been denied the request to light the Y, so we prepared strings of lights that would simulate that same aspect of clumps around us. When the Y is lit, it's almost like a magnet. Everybody will see it from down there, and everybody wants to hike up here. We have close to 400 to 1,000 people that hike this every day. Standing 380 feet tall, the Y is five times the height of the H in Hollywood, visible from anywhere in Utah Valley. For BYU alumni and friends, seeing the Y on the mountain is more than a geographical marker. It has become a symbol of service, of unity, and of coming home. That letter has been there throughout my whole life. It's an old friend. It means more than a letter on a mountain. It's just a very special, warm, fuzzy feeling inside when I see it. It puts a lump in my throat. It makes me feel as if I'm coming home. The students know when they see the Y on the mountain that they're at home and they're cared for. The spirit of the Y is 33,000 young men and women strong. It's the soul, the heartbeat that defines BYU. It's a really well done video that documents some of the things that can be done with the University Archives. Uh, they came in and did a lot of extensive research in the documents and came up with a script, a story of White Mountain, and then they went and found uh, video footage and photographs uh, that document the history of the university. There are a myriad of ways that the university archives materials can be used. Uh, it's my hope uh, that my presentation has sparked a little interest in coming down to the university archives, coming down to special collections to get to know the materials that we have, to get to know better the unique place that is Brigham Young University. Uh, I, I thank you for coming, and I think we'll have a few uh, minutes for questions. First, could you verify that on the back side of Y Mountain is the phrase, why not? Is, is that true? <laughs> uh, okay. I think what I'd like to ask is um, about on campus, you are the University Archives, but I can imagine that there are other collections. I know in the sports area they have kind of a museum. Uh, and that, So could you speak about kind of if you have connections with other parts of campus and how that all works together. We do. Um, some, is, some entities on campus have started their own exhibits and they've had them for years and years, uh, many of them before I showed up. Um, periodically they'll contact me and say, what do we do with these materials? And my first response is, let me come over and see what you have and see if it actually came from the University Archives and if I need to repossess it and give you facsimile so you don't have original sitting out in the open. Uh, we recently did that with the Honors Program over the Mazer Building. They had a memorial exhibit to Carl G. Mazer. Uh, they contacted me. We went over, took a look at the materials, realized that some of them were original photographs from the collection, asked for the photographs back, and provided them with some facsimiles to use in that exhibit. Uh, with regards to the Athletic Hall of Fame, if you go down and take a look at the, the photographs, the photographs for the first hundred years of that Athletic Hall of Fame timeline come from the University Archives. I worked quite closely with Duff Tittle, who is the Athletic uh, Media Relations, uh, I guess he's the department head, uh, in selecting those images and helping him identify materials that he could use. Uh, a couple of years ago, Duff also published uh, with the Football Vault Company a book on BYU football. Uh, the, a lot of the materials in there, again, come from the archives. There's um, facsimiles of tickets from the 1930s and other kind of fun little things that are in that book that they made from materials in the university archives. Uh, we try and maintain a, an open relationship and let people know, you know, I don't have to have everything in my collections. Uh, I'm not possessive in that sense. But I do want to know what people are collecting on campus, and I want them to be aware that if they don't think that they've got the environmental conditions or the know-how or the wherewithal to take care of the materials, I'm more than happy to bring them into the archives, and we're more than happy to make them available to them to use. 
and most campus departments have been very receptive to that. Other questions? I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, I think um, when I talked to Roy Peterman, I think he mentioned that they've got a, an outlet box down at the base of it that they run power up ex uh, exclusively for that. You can imagine why the Forest Service in the 1970s says, no, we don't want you to be lighting mattress soaked in grease on our mountain. Um, it's amazing that they didn't burn the mountain down. Um, I had a history professor who talked about, uh, he was in the Intercollegiate Knights, and for many years the Intercollegiate Knights were responsible for lighting the Y. They would literally have all of their club up on the mountains surrounding the Y, and he talked about stamping out little brush fires as they started. Uh, and he, he was like, you know, I think we were crazy, but it sure looks cool. <laughs>